1890 with the symbolists, or maybe even like 1910 with the futurists, and that's kind of what we recognize as being avant-garde now, because a lot of that stuff is still shocking, in, in, to, a, to an extent, to normal people. Um, but in fact, the first time that the word was used was 1829, and there's this whole prehistory that's kind of been written out of even like underground history. So, so what I'm doing here is looking at one of the kind of big, famous practices of the avant-garde, which is sound poetry, poetry without words. And usually the traditional kind of like invention of that is, is, is usually people say it was invented by the futurists, um, who were a bunch of fascist avant-gardists around 1910. Um, fortunately, we not really the fascists who invented it, they just kind of grabbed it. <laughs> um, so some of this research is actually particularly like it's not like cutting edge, it's like the edge is still cutting, meaning I still am figuring it out. There's stuff in here that I just discovered like two weeks ago and I'm kind of going to have to be like, all right, I've had an hour to look at a 300 page book in French. I think this is what he's talking about. So it's a little bit, you know, it, it may change in a year or two. Some of it is pretty interesting. So, um, so basically what we're looking at then is Radical linguistics and radical poetry going back to, actually I'm going to draw it all the way back to 1765. Um, there are tons and tons of practices that are ancient and traditional that go into sound poetry. Tons of cultures, I mean, it, it, the West is actually kind of unique in that it is so strange to do sound poetry, quote unquote. A lot of, a lot of cultures have wordless songs and that's a big part of what they do. There are all kinds of traditions, I can't cover everything. So for this, I'm going to be concentrating on ideas and practices that I know the, that people in the avant-garde are paying attention to, just to kind of keep, keep, uh, keep everything kind of limited. Um, but I'm going to kind of touch on a few of what those other sources were. I'm also going to be talking mostly about the, the earlier stuff that nobody knows about. And I'm going to be touching on Dada and Futurism and stuff that's not quite as obscure. Um, so, a big part of what makes sound poetry phonetics, right? Um, a lot of avant-garde practice in sound poetry comes out of hermeticism and occultism. Um, most people involved with the avant-garde in the first few generations have at least tangential relationships with occultism. Some of them were, you know, full out, like, con you know, conducting magical rituals and having magical notebooks many of which were pictographic and things like that. Um, phonetics has a big role in Hermeticism, and you can do a whole three hour lecture on that easily. But instead, I'm going to spend like a minute and say Kabbalah. <laughs> um, you know, within the practice of the Kabbalah, which again is gigantic, I can't get into it all. Um, but it all comes down to letters, numbers, and pattern, and that if you have, that, that, that letters and numbers have a relationship, Pattern is just a version of number, right? Um, cycles, repetition, and so you have this long tradition in, in various parts of, of Hermeticism and occultism of, of meditation, meditating on numbers, meditating on letters, um, and things like that. You've got mysticisms of sound. Certain letters have certain oral resonances that relate to certain aspects of the universe, and when you make the sound A, it's like you're tuning your some part of the world or something like that. So these are ideas that are going into it. Um, Gerard de Nerval, who was uh, one of the founders of the avant-garde, um, and the, there are his, his friend Gautier, who I'll be talking about, says Nerval used to have this notebook full of just um, you know letter combinations and, and drawings, you know drawings with hermetic import. They all got lost. Philo Theonetti, another founder of the first avant-garde group, um, we had his, the catalog of his library. He owned about a hundred medieval occult manuscripts, and this is not a rich man. He was working like middle management, basically. So he was pretty involved. Um, just as one little example of what that kind of thing, how that kind of thing inflects what we're going to be talking about, I'm going to go through and do. This is not one they would have used. This is actually a, a, a chant from the Nag Hammadi Gnostic text. These are texts that 
were buried in the desert because they were banned when the Catholic Church was being founded. Um, so these are, are heretical texts of what Christianity was before the, the Catholic Church. And there is uh, this chant in here, B-A-B-E, B, long E, B-I, B-O, B-U, B, long O. So it would be something like... Ba, be, 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 bo, ba, bu. 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 Ba be bi be bo ba 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 bu. Ba ba bi ba 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 bo ba bu. So you can see how already you can see how already this is moving toward what uh, Kurt Schwitters is going to end up sounding like in the 1920s, coming off of a lot of these same ideas. Um, so it's kind of in the background of these people's minds. Um, and then linguistics. Linguistics was undergoing a big revolution at the time. This uh, is basically the generation of the people who first founded what they called the avant-garde. Um, were the first generation to grow up with ideas about Indo-European being in the background. So what this means is that A, it's kind of a blow against Eurocentrism to an extent um, early on because suddenly they have to recognize that we actually have these relationships with people who are not white and with those practices and that has, a, has an effect I think on how people are thinking about it. People are also really interested in etymology of all things, um, obsessed with like the histories of words and how language develops, and they're trying to develop forms of language that will support new forms of society. So this is this is something that they're interested in. Um, it also made people start thinking, well, okay, if all languages in Europe and Asia can be traced to one language, does it stop there? And so you have the beginnings of people looking for a transrational language, a language that would um, communicate without there being a division between English, French, German, whatever. Is there a level of language that underlies what we think of as language? And that, um, that has to do with a lot of why people would do sound poetry, um, really, to this day. Um, you also have these traditions of plain song and things like that. Uh, a lot of traditional cultures that were still surviving at that time in, in the countryside. Um, you had traditions, even in Europe, of, of wordless song and stuff like that. And keep in mind, the Romantics were the first people to start looking at folk culture and writing it down, like the Brothers Grimm, for instance. Um, and so this is also where they're getting a lot of these ideas. Um, and Graham was also involved in the European, so you have a lot of these things that kind of tie up. Um, and then along with this, people are starting to do a lot of research into, into the aspects of language that don't make sense in the way that most language does. So they're looking at automatopoeia, uh, they're looking at, uh, well, phonology is, is, is first becoming really big, how do we physically make these sounds? Um, and avant-garde romanticism in particular, Weirdly, you had some people just obsessed with etymology. Uh, Nodier, who I'll talk about. Petrus Burrell, apparently when he was nine, um, he, he was raised in a monastery. He freaked out the priest because he was so obsessed with uh, Latin dictionaries um, and you know, just tracing etymology. And they were like, this is crazy. What's wrong with this kid? Um, a guy named Bibliophile Jacob, he's kind of right there in the name, was doing a lot of these kinds of research. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to start off with two major elements of sound poetry that we can kind of look at how they develop here. One is phonetics, the sounds that are being made, how they're being made, how they're being arranged. That also involves automatopoeia, in other words, sounds that, words that are supposed to sound like the sound they make, like meow, would be automatopoeia, right? Um, 
But the interesting thing about meow is that cats only say meow in English. So this leads on to the other thing with, we're dealing with, which is orthography. How do you spell things? And this becomes a really big issue with sound poetry. How do you spell something? Because we can't just recognize the word and know what it means. Um, you have to kind of make it up or figure it out. Um, and then repetition pattern is the other big, big aspect of things. So sound patterning, which starts with rhyme but then can get weirder. You've got like basically designification of a word through repetition. If you just repeat a word or two words fast enough or long enough, eventually they kind of lose me. Um, and, and then combinatory techniques. How do you how do you arrange these things? So down to the history. There'll be more performance now than there has been. Uh, my first reading is going to be from 1765, and this is by Lawrence Stern, in one of the funny, well, okay, one of the funniest books of the 18th century, I should have claimed it. Um, one of the funniest books of the last few hundred years, I think. Um, uh, big influence on Monty Python. And what I'm going to do here is, is basically based on repetition. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I just skipped somebody, I'm starting with Rabelais, 1546, hold that, I'm sorry. So, Rabelais, medieval monk, believe it or not, uh, the church wanted him dead, but uh, he was protected by various nobles and other churches that were against the Pope because of the Middle Ages. Um, I'm just going to read this long, the sound poem, it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, it's basically about uh, genitalia. Musty ball bag, moldy ball bag, mildewed ball bag, dangling ball bag, chilled ball bag, swallowed ball bag, cowardly ball bag, cow ball bag, broken down ball bag, broken back ball bag, incongruous ball bag, defective ball bag, threadbare ball bag, buggered ball bag, a prostrated ball bag, be shitten ball bag. Squatting ball bag, wheedled ball bag, skinned ball bag, squeezed ball bag, suppressed ball bag, dispirited ball bag, recalcitrant ball bag, punitive ball bag, exhausted ball bag, worm eaten ball bag, wasted ball bag, wheezing ball bag, frozen ball bag, luckless ball bag, wretched ball bag. out ball bag, disgusted ball bag, burst ball bag, chewed ball bag, scattered ball bag, shelleted ball bag, gleaned ball bag, mitered ball bag, reprimanded ball bag, censured ball bag, churned ball bag, cheated ball bag, tickled ball bag, hustled ball bag, muttered ball bag, spattered ball bag, emptied ball Emasculated ball bag, unitized ball bag, battered ball bag, incised ball bag, twisted ball bag, speckled ball bag, mangy ball bag, quarrelsome ball bag, varicose ball bag, geariness ball bag, maggoty ball bag, tottering ball bag, limping ball bag, ragged ball bag, trifling ball bag, stamped out ball bag, adulterated ball bag, conceited ball bag. Ball bag, eviscerated ball bag, constipated ball bag, misted ball bag, hailed on ball bag, enlightened ball bag, slapped ball bag, cut ball bag, buffeted ball bag, slashed ball bag, pink ball bag, face slap ball bag, cut ball bag, star face ball bag, lighted ball bag, erupted ball bag, packing ball bag, scottish ball bag, thrashed ball bag, beaten ball bag, theory ball bag, chap ball bag, fistular ball. Ball bag, scrupulous ball bag, slanderous ball bag, sealed ball bag, criminal ball bag. 
bag, degraded ball bag, crippled ball bag, numb ball bag, confused ball bag, fat like ball bag, disagreeable ball bag, farting ball bag, overwhelmed ball bag, weather beaten ball bag, sanded ball bag, torn ball bag, sorry ball bag, stunned ball bag, declining ball bag, corning ball bag, solicizing ball bag, appealing ball bag, thin ball bag, strike ball bag, assassinated ball bag, hatched ball bag, rod ball bag, starved ball bag, listless ball bag, dumper ball bag, doughy ball bag, a null ball bag, gaping ball bag, crumpled ball bag, unloaded ball bag. <laughs> so, so that's 1546. Those of you who think the Middle Ages were what people like you to think. Uh, so now on to Stern, who I already explained at the wrong time. Uh, this is one of his list poems in 1765, talking about how many streets there are in Paris. So it's the one after this. Oh, no, right. right. Um, so he informs us, Paris does contain 900 streets, these. In the quarter called the city, there are 53 streets. In St. James of the Shambles, 55 streets. In St. Opportune, 34 streets. In the quarter of the Louvre, 25 streets. In the Palace Royal or St. Honorius, 49 streets. In St. Montmartre, 41 streets. In St. Eustace, 29 streets. In the Hall, 27 streets. In St. Denis, 55 streets. In St. Martin, 54 streets. In St. Paul or the Montoyerie, 27 streets. The Grave, 38 streets. In St. Avoy or the Verrerie, 19 streets. In the Marais or the Temple, 52 streets. In St. Antonis, 68 streets. In the Place Maubert, 81 streets. In St. Benet, 60 streets. In St. Andrews des Arc, 51 streets. In the quarter of the Luxembourg, 62 streets. And in that of St. Germain, 55 streets, into any one of which you may walk. So it's easy at this point. By the time you get to the 50th repetition of ball bag, it's not even funny anymore, unless the other word before it is, because it's just sounds right? Same thing with this one. Now, a couple chapters after that in the same book, this is Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern, um, he has another tape which gets a little bit closer to what we think of as sound poetry, and this is ours. The, the situation here is that there are two, uh, two nuns, notice how many of these are dirty, two nuns who really want to swear. Uh, they want to say bouge, bouge, which is bugger, right? I'm Rochelle. <laughs> It's weird because I couldn't find these in the encyclopedia, in the dictionary, and online, and then eventually I found somewhere where it told me that they were swear words. So. What's that? Bouge, bouge, and fout, and fouté. You might maybe each of them. Bouge, So. From what I can tell, it's it's a uh, bugger and fucker. Right, so I'm, we're going to do it first in the original French in an English book, uh, and then we'll do a translation of it. <laughs> All right, so I'm yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so this is how they got around swearing because the, they're nuns, they can't swear, right? So they break it up. So they go. All right. So, uh, so they decided to do it this way. Boo she, boo she, boo she. Te. Oh, I'm sorry. Boo te, boo te, boo te. Boo she, boo she, boo she, boo she, boo she, boo she. Quicker still. Margarita. Boo she, boo she. Boo-chay! 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 Bo
nation, maybe. Bugger, bugger, bugger. <laughs> fuck her, fuck her, fuck her. Bugger, 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 bugger. Quicker, stop my margarita. Preserve me, said the abbess. They don't understand us, cried Margarita, but the devil does, said the abbess and I. <laughs> so we're getting, uh, getting closer there. Uh -huh. Now, if you notice that both of those, again, I pointed out both the Rabelais and the Stern, they're dirty jokes. So it's interesting that, like, if you trace some poetry back far enough, a lot of it's rooted in dirty jokes. Why? Because you can't say them, so you need to get around it. That kind of is the case generally. For most of the 19th century, most sound poetry, what we would now retroactively identify as sound poetry, was presented as satire, because you can get away with it. If you want to do something really fucking crazy, call it comedy, and your chances of getting it passed just went up about 500%, right? So, uh, so that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. Now, in France, one of the first people in France to become really heavily uh, influenced by Stern, who we just heard, is a guy named Charles Nodier, um, who uh, is extremely important in all kinds of ways if you are into weird shit. Um, so, he had a huge influence. One, as an organizer, um, the, for those of you who this means something to, uh, when the French Romanticist army took over the French, uh, basically the French uh, cultural in infrastructure in 1830, a lot of that was planned at his, uh, his weekly meetings, his weekly salons at the, Biblio at the Arsenal Library in Paris, which is the second biggest uh, library in Paris, which he was the chief librarian of. Uh, he was a mentor of a whole lot of people who were really important in the history of the avant-garde. They're mostly forgotten now, but their influence kind of kept getting passed on. Um, he, so he mentored a lot of people. He wrote some of the first frenetic, uh, kind of gothic horror avant-garde novels. Um, he wrote, I talked about him last year here, he did some of the first, uh, some, uh, some of the first visual poetry within the avant-garde kind of uh, really interesting stuff with how he's laying out his typography and stuff like that. Um, he was also one of the first people to start publishing novels based on dream, dream uh, writing in France. Um, so, you know, the, the precursor of the Surrealists in that regard. He's also largely responsible for the fact that there are still medieval buildings in France. And when they were trying to tear them all down in the 1820s, Nadier led a huge public campaign to say, whoa, 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 stop tearing down all our medieval buildings. This is our history. Um, and he published several books uh, of, of uh, plates of ruins and things, uh, French ruins, to try to popularize medieval culture to, to save these things. And he was very important in the history of linguistics, um, not least uh, uh, he was, he was a, a prominent philologist, so looking at the history of language, he coined a lot of new words, and um, he did a lot of etymological work on um, automatopoeia. And so he published uh, the first French dictionary of automatopoeia um, as well. So, uh, in addition to all of that, he also published one of the earliest sound poems, the earliest one that I've found, that is just presented as such. This is in 1830 in a book, uh, an experimental novel called The Seven Castles of the King of Bohemia. That actually, that name is taken from Stern, who we just listened to. Um, this is what Nodier says about the sound poem he inserts in here, which I'm about to read. He says, 
This page, entirely unique among all the written monuments of language, hides beneath the appearance of a simple witticism, in other words, I'm pretending this is a satire, the strongest effort of creative imagination, the secret of the novum organum and the characteristic, the universal intelligence that the cantists, ecclesiastics, and pundits so in love with clarity still seek gropingly. Um, so he's tying it in with this idea of universal language. Um, before I read that, actually I'm going to jump out of chronology here. I'm going to read you a futurist poem first, and then I'm going to read you the Nodier poem. So this is a futurist poem from around 1910. Canzo Maggio by Giacomo Balac. <laughs> Because he mentors so many of them. 
um, and, and because they were reading his work. So part of this is, takes the form of, of uh, more musicality, an emphasis on musicality of the sound in their, in their normal uh, poetry, the way that they pattern sound, things like that. Um, um, they really like creating new words, neologisms, um, which in France is particularly not done because it, it, you've got the, uh, the Académie Française basically putting a, deciding what is and isn't French, um, which the English don't really have. So that was actually more radical in the, in the context than it, it might appear to us. Um, they start messing with grammar. Philo Feonetti, who I'm working on translating a bunch of stuff on right now, will use adverbs as adjectives, adjectives as adverbs, and things like that. They'll use archaic words that seem like neologisms, but it's actually from like early Middle French. Or they'll mess with grammar and use old grammatical constructions that were no longer in use anymore by the 1830s. So this is also, they're doing this partly to mess with, with the sound of the, of the poetry as well. Um, um, but it, it got to the point with Romanticism and the avant-garde that they actually identified certain letters as being specifically Romanticist. And so you have this really interesting kind of emphasis on letters that you haven't, haven't seen in, in this context before. So this is um, from the preface to Victor Hugo's book, Hond of Iceland, from 1826, I want to say. Um, he says, the author confines him, this is him quoting, uh, I'm quoting him, I should say, the author confines himself to stating that the picturesque part of the story has been the object of his especial care, that K's, Y's, H's, and W's abound in it. Although he uses those, these romanticist letters with extreme temperance, witness the historic name of Golden Lou, G-U-L-D-E-N-L-E-W, which some chroniclers write Golden Lue, G-U-L-D-E-N-L-O-E-W-E, a liberty which he has not dared to allow himself. That there will also be found numerous diphthongs varied with much taste and elegance. So a substantial part of this preface is in telling you we're going to have more diphthongs than French is supposed to, and things like that, right? Um, he actually did get blasted for having these kinds of, of words and letters. I mean, because these are all letters that don't occur very often in French. Um, he got blasted by the press for using these letters. So, um, yeah, in the second edition, he actually had to reply to the, the, the criticism and say that he would invite the Norwegians to change their language in as much as the hideous jargon they're whimsical enough to employ wounds the ears of Parisian ladies. Um, uh, so there's, there's a strong nationalistic element to the opposition to this, this kind of thing. What's interesting is that then you see Théophile Gautier, another founder of the avant-garde, um, coming, who is very much coming out of Hugo, one of, uh, kind of idolized Hugo, about seven years later in his short story about avant-garde lifestyles, he says, um, this is, he's got a romanticist character who's, who's converting a classicist to romanticism and telling him how to become a uh, romanticist, how to become properly avant-garde. And he says, quote, he spent the next six months in quest of a pseudonym, and by dint of trying and racking his brain, he managed to find one. The first name ended in us, and the surname was stuffed as full of K's, W's, and other such romanticist consonants as he could cram into eight syllables. It would have taken six days and six nights merely to spell it out. <laughs> Same letters. So you actually do have this, the, like people are actually putting like this kind of communal value on particular letters. Again, that kind of attention is kind of a step toward the toward toward what sound poetry becomes. Um, it also tells it is interesting. He talks about like that that the us at the end of the name. People's names became little sound poems almost. The us of uh, Pierre Borel became Petrus Borel because of the medieval form of the name. So again, the same kind of thing. And he's the guy who was doing etymology and you know is freaking out the monks. Um, Louis Bertrand becomes Aloysius Bertrand. Uh, Jean du Seigneur becomes Jehan du Seigneur. That was interesting because what they, I don't have this thing written. Um, it's one, one word, du Seigneur, right? But if you split it in half, du Seigneur means of a lord. You'll notice a lot of French poets um, added de to their name even though they were not aristocrats. You know, Alfred de Musset, not an aristocrat. Um, 
on and on and on. People will give them flack sometimes when people condescend to pay attention at all and be like, well, but you're talking about being democratic and against risk aristocracy, but you added duh to your name. First off, people have senses of humor. That's a big part of it. They were just like, that would be hilarious if I called myself a lord. But also, it's playing into this, just kind of adding syllables to my name to make my name into something else. You know? Um, in addition to these kinds of things, of another one, like again, I'm working with Theophile Dundee right now. He rearranged letters of his name added grammatically into Philothe Onet. And the way that he used that, he, he refused to use the pseudonym after his first book until, as he put it, there are no more bourgeoisie. Uh -huh. So it wasn't just a joke. It, he rearranges the letters of his name and it, it's a rearrangement of himself. If he can't appear in a certain version of himself, he's not going to use the name. Um, speaking of names, the first avant-garde group, the Bouzon Joe. This is not where it came from, but for a long time people thought it came from the French Boussin um, noise, uh, or uproar. Um, and they really liked noise and sound in general. If you remember my last year's lecture when I talked about noise and music, these guys were doing noise concerts in their backyard where the only rule was that if you learned to play an instrument, you couldn't use it anymore. Um, you know, so this, it's just a matter of this mentality being shifted over to language. Um, uh, before the Battle of Hernani, um, there, you had 300 romanticists inside a theater for seven hours in the dark because the management was trying to cause a riot to get them arrested so that the play would fail. Mm -hmm. um, they spent about two hours apparently just making animal noises at each other <laughs> across the theater, which when you again, when you realize every one of these people had read Charles Nodier, there's, you know, there, there, there's, that's a part of what's going on in addition to the like, why wouldn't you do that? Because what else are you gonna do? So there's also that. Um, but finally, in the end of the, uh, the, the last story in the collection that I just read something out of Gautier from, The Bowl of Punch, uh, he has a, uh, a romanticist event, avant-garde events in the 1830s were called orgies. They weren't actually orgies. They were more like uh, weird, uh, like a, I don't know, radicalized LARPing event. I don't know, they're weird. But um, at the end of it, they bring out a flaming bowl of punch, um, and uh, it leads to an improvised simultaneous ball, which some of you think. Oh yes, no, this is the two first. Um, it's easy. I'm sure it is. No, which one? So this is, uh, this is 1833, and it's again from a, a description of a romanticist party. Bam, bam, clackling, aye, aye, ah, oh, bay, oh, ew, what? short, simultaneous poems. That's written side by side, is how that scores. Um, and that's how the novel ends, um, which is interesting. Also, you may have noted in there that he actually directly references the um, Nodier poem. Uh, pan, pan, is comes from, had a plan, had a plan. Um, so there, there are a few, a few things in there. So again, explicitly, saying this is a tradition I'm carrying on from no DNA. Um, okay, now is the fourth part of Paul. There's the fourth person. Yeah. So the fourth person. <laughs> Thomas Love. Yo, Tom! It's easy. Anyway, yeah. do it. Here. Somebody volunteer. Somebody read, it's like five letters. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Right. I don't know. Okay, so, so you'll be here. This one? Yeah. 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 He's not a romanticist, but W is fun. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I named Enten Why we get to tell you? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I'll okay. Yeah, so this is a Dada poem just to compare it to that last one. Alright. 
He has a book on hermaphrodism, um, a book on the relation of humans to animals, a book on the folly of animals. Why are animals less smart than us? The book I'm specifically interested in here is called The Idiomology of Animals, or Historical, Anatomical, Physiological, Philological, and Glossological Research on the Language of Beasts. So, what he reveals to us is that animals and humans could once speak together. We all understood each other. The scientific proof is in the Bible. In Genesis, you will remember, hence the Tower of Babel Press, right? Um, but we grew apart after the fall, unfortunately. Um, so, in order to recover this ability to speak to animals, which we used to have, um, he creates the science of idiomology, which is to be to to match uh, human a human speech idiom to a human language group. So, for instance, nightingales. Language is akin to the Italian language, apparently. Uh, sparrows are, I want to say English, if I'm remembering correctly. I may have gotten this That's wrong, don't right. quote me on it. So, yeah. Um, he was very interested in Chinese and Native American languages, too. He did some pioneering work on that. Um, and then he also created this science called glossology, the study of glossolalia. Um, so the, the linguistics. The linguistics of instinctive utterance is the closest I could come to what it is. The linguistics of just being like, ow, that hurt. Why do you say ow instead of like, wee, that hurt. <laughs> that apparently is glossology. Glossology, sorry. Um, so he has systems of animal vocabulary. He talks about animal syntax. Um, and he has a mini glossary of the marmoset language, which is kind of fun. It's in that book, passing around. Um, yeah. Uh, he does talk about the physiological differences of different animals on language, um, pretty scientifically. Um, and he, uh, he compares the orthography of various European wordless interjections um, and kind of says, you know, like, okay, so, like, I use the example meow. What is it in each language? He's got a kind of a table with, like, 15 languages. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he rejects what he calls alphabetism because it, if, if the orthography that the alphabet uses can't actually re reproduce animal language because it has more to do with inflection and gesture than English, English than human languages do. So, um, what, as a part of this project, in there he has included transcriptions of bird song in phonetic form. So I'm going to uh, perform a couple of them. Mind you, I am not a bird watcher, so I, this is based on the score and listening to a YouTube video of nightingales and being like, that must be what it's supposed to be. And then I'm trying to remember it. So here we go. Nightingale language. Nightingale poem. <laughs> Oh, 
Did he try to transcribe that into any other language? Not that I know of. It would be really nice to have a translation, wouldn't it? <laughs> Laughter acronyms. Wow. Uh, so, um, so yeah. So there we are. Um, so again, you know, kind of interesting. And he does have these weird connections with the avant-garde. Um, moving. That's that, that was from the 1840s. Also in the 1840s, you had basically a bunch of people who Gautier had trained. Um, or at least a kind of mentor, I should say. Um, and a lot of them move into a movement known as Parnassianism, which is maybe the m most obscure movement of the 19th century in English. No one talks about it in English. Um, which makes it hard for me to talk about. Um, but they did really push that element again of like sound and rhythm being the basis of poetry, you know, over semantics. Um, so I, I can't, I, I would have to read them in French because nobody translates their work and because their work is so specific to the French language. I can't read French well enough. That What's that? You can't translate this. No, and, and, and that's really sad. And I, I'm not going to try to read it. I'm not quite there yet. Um, allowed. But what I am going to do is to read, um, the Parnassians were the first people to really champion Poe's work. Um, and they championed his work largely um, on the basis of the sound. So what I'm going to do is, this is actually um, just the sound patterning of the beginning of Pose the Raven. Oh, pan me weary, pan we weary, oh, me quuk, me or, or, what me snapping, you tapping, someone rapping, rapping at my chamber door, tis some tapping at my chamber door, oh, this war. The at ember, late December, eats it, the ember, ought, oh, or. E, oro, a, s, oro, but, s, sorrow, sorrow, or, os, or. Rare, ray, a, 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 or, a, ear, or, or. So there I'm only reading the elements of the poem that get repeated, okay? And then of course you read the on its own, once upon a midnight dreary, while I ponder, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten war. You know the ravens. The kind of sound pattern that they're most interested in, right? And if you take out the non-pattern parts, as you see there, it turns into a sound poem. Um, so this is kind of where, what they're interested in. That's as close as I can get to an idea of what the war really should sound like. Um, out of this, you get the next generation, especially well-known being Verlaine and Rambeau. Um, so Rambeau is coming out of, again, the, the same kind of idea, sound sensation. They're really interested in synesthesia, too. Um, how, you, you know, how one sense relates to the other. Um, I'm going to read a short sonnet by Rambeau. Again, it's really kind of nonsense because these sounds that he's described are very different in French, but I'm going to go for it. Because it does get the idea of how by the late 19th century, the third quarter of the century, people were starting to think about um, sound, the, the way they were starting to think about sound. So he says, a, black, E, white, I, red, U, green, O, blue, vowels. Someday I'll tell you where your genesis lies. A, black velvet swarms of flies buzzing, buzzing above the stench avoided vowels. A gulf of shadow, E, where the iceberg rushes, white mists, tents, kings, shady strips. I, purple, spilt blood, laughter of sweet lips in anger, or the penitence of lushes. You, cycle of time, rhythm of seas, peace of the paws of animals and wrinkles on scholars' brows, stripes, trinkles. Oh, the supreme trumpet notes, peace of the spheres of the angels. Oh, equals x-ray of her eyes, it equals sex. I don't know how good that is. It's translated by Miss Gerald, which is a little bit dodgy. But, um, we do see this kind of theorization of vowels and sounds and how those things work. Um, 
So, uh, there we want to Verlaine. I, uh, this tends to be grouped with Rumbo because the latter ruined his life. Um, but, um, fascinating poet. Uh, associated with Rambo, associated with the pronounced contemporane that who I just talked about, also with, with uh, symbolism, which is just beginning at this time. Um, and he was very interested in experimental spelling, experimental orthography. So, um, that's what this next poem is kind of coming out of. It's dedicated to a Monsieur Dubinou. Probably not a real person. Um, I tried, I looked him up, other people have tried. Um, there's no record of this guy if he existed, but he may have been a pamphleteer because there are a lot of people doing this. Um, a lot of debate about the, how French should be spelled around the late 19th century. And so this is him getting into that. And again, it's again satirical, um, placed as satire. So what he's done is he's spelled the poem, um, it says uh, A.A. Divinu, a two ardent opponent to phonetic orthography. So he's tried to spell out phonetically the way that the French would be read. I, this is, I'm going to read this in the, the messed up French. Um, one thing you need to understand is that there's a weird thing in French verse where you do not necessarily pronounce the E at the ends of certain words. You may, in some, time, in some cases it's your choice, sometimes you can't, sometimes you do, you count it but you may not necessarily pronounce it. Okay? So, He's partly making fun of that by putting E's between parentheses so that you have to decide whether you should pronounce it or not. And the other thing to hear out is it's all, you have to know a bit of French to see how funny it is, but I'm going to try to get across. This is how we go. Et quoi vraiment, bon du bing no, vous aussi du que les meilleur que le pain qu'on mange, vous mettrez ces coulous étranges contre ce tas de braves gens au fond plus bec que mes chants répandent nos linguistiques éthiques dans l'orthographe phonétique. Quel ir donc vous en va là vis-à-vis de ces oiseaux-là Zouba suffit d'un parole verbe et pour le prier son débat, qu'il ait des mots que n'atteint pas le système des ombres mères. <laughs> uh, in the original printing, it's dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to keep that to Michelle. <laughs> mentored by Nodier. So we're seeing with all of these a chain of, of actual friendships that, that traverse the whole century. Um, and that this poetic prose process is a part of that. Um, so symbolism kind of systematizes all these phonetic correspondences. They're looking at a lot of science and trying to say, okay, how does the nervous system work? Why does this, not only what does the vowel a make me feel, but how does that relate to my nervous system? And how does that relate to cognition? And how does that relate to consciousness? And how does that relate to modernity? And so they're kind of trying to tie all of these things up. Um, uh, you know, very, very interested in cognition and psychology. Um, so we're going to look at one symbolist um, who, interestingly enough, is from Virginia. He was born in Norfolk. His name is uh, Francis Vieille Gleifin. Um, his father was a uh, Union uh, Army General in the Civil War. His mother was French. Um, they divorced early in his childhood, went to France, never came back to the United States, refused to remain English. But still, Virginian. Um, 
Uh, he was, so he also was mentored by Mallarmé. He was a friend of Alfred Jarry. Um, and uh, he was, uh, his theory was that poetic rhythm, it, when you're writing a poem, the rhythm that you write into your poem relates to the internal rhythms, the muscular rhythms, the rhythms of your heartbeat and breathing at the moment. And that what poetry does with rhythm is to translate one person's physical experience of a particular moment to another person through the poem. And this is just this, this is a, a large part of the poetics he's basing his work on. Okay? Um, now, in 1890, he becomes the first person I'm aware of to suggest um, electronically manipulated sound poetry. So this is only a few years after the gramophone's been invented, and he has an article which I have yet to fully read and translate. I've read um, uh, uh, descriptions of the article. But he, um, he basically says, okay, sure, now we can read poetry on phonograph, but after that, you could alter that recording. So this is 1890. So this is kind of where eventually Henri Chopin and Paul Degree and, and some poets like that are, are going to explore that territory. Um, he also, in that same uh, issue, publishes a poem in the Bible book, which when I found, I thought was a pure sound, sound poem. And I was like, what is this in 1890? Turns out, again, he frames it as a joke. Valapuk is a precursor of Esperanto. So it's an invented language that a guy made up in the 1870s, I think, maybe the 1880s, because I don't have my notes on it here. Um, yes, I do. So, 1879, it was invented. Uh, lasted until about 1900 when Esperanto kind of became more popular among those 18 people who were interested in those kinds of things. Um, so, um, so he wrote several poems in Bala Puk, and I'm going to read this one apart. I'm going to read one from here. Things in between explaining how it proves 
that we're descended from frogs. Um, I'll depart from that. <laughs> Move on to another person who I wish I could read you some stuff by, but I can't. Um, his name is Jacques-Henri Barzon, um, and he wrote the first simultaneous poems in the 1890s. Um, he was a uh, he was a symbolist poet. He probably knew the Allegri family. They had enough mutual friends anyway. Um, he was a friend of Apollinaire, a friend of Marinetti, who is often credited with inventing sound poetry. Um, um, you know, and, 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 and Zara specifically mentions him by name as being uh, inspiring uh, the Dada sound, uh, simultaneous poems as well. Um, what's odd about all this, uh, he was also, mind you, a friend of Duchamp, uh, Edouard Barres. Nothing on I could not find even an image of anything online at all, in any language. So I don't know why no one thought that was worth doing. But anyway, somebody who should be in the lecture but is not, because yeah, I don't know. Um, so on to Italian futurism. They loved onomatopoeia. I already read one of their poems. They were fascists. <laughs> on to Zoom. <laughs> The Zoom movement, Russian futurism, the non-fascist futurist, pretty cool. Uh, we're pretty much into more standard avant-garde territory here, so I'm just kind of picking up and tying that off. Um, the idea of Zoom was a transrational language, so this is kind of where that those initial things people were thinking about in Nodier's day, the um, the Zoom poets finally kind of really say this is the main thing we're dealing with. Is, is trying to discover this. Is that sound? I don't know how. Is it Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, but, um, right. So, yeah, so coming out of base, the same kind of uh, search that Vala Pook and Esperanto were, but in this case, they're, um, they're, going at it in a more intuitive way, in a less analytical way, I guess maybe would be a way to put it. Um, uh, they're not trying to construct a new vocabulary. They're trying to do away with vocabulary. Um, can, you do, can you have a language without words, is kind of what they're asking, as opposed to can we create new words that everyone will understand. Um, a lot of this is coming from folklore. Again, weirdly, I know there are some out there, but I could not find online and don't have in my library any actual, uh, any, of the z any of the sound poems that are transrational in nature. I've got other stuff by them, but nothing where they're actually using constructed synthetic languages. What I do have is a traditional poem that they um, transcribed in one of their journals as what they wanted to do, but this is actually um, a traditional Russian um, peasant uh, form of, of, of song without words. Of course, couldn't find any examples of that online anywhere either to find out what it sounded like, which surprised me. So I'm going to perform it, but I don't know how it would have sounded originally, really. But, um, but we can see how it kind of plays back with all the stuff we've been listening to and some stuff, especially with that Nazi form. Kumara, Mich, Mich, Basombara. Esho shoma lo vasa shivoda Kumara E E O O O O E E E O O O E E E E E E E E E E E E E Shun shan we shoda sara gujatan 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 Iyo iya o Iyo iya za iyo iya pazo Iyo iya pe pazo Suka jima su suoma nika misam shoda Shoro shikta migasa mesh 
vita buoco con dir li ama buoco alti ruisciaro rossano rissaro zalimo io ia o io ia do io naie do io ia do
Yeah. Ahoy! Boom! Ahoy! Boom! in their nature. Yep. Let's speak to the Monsieur Equatorial. My great